Robin Hood, the legendary outlaw and hero. Retold by Neil Philip, read by Johan Griffith. Chapter 1 Robert of Huntington One fine spring morning, Robert, Earl of Huntington, went to meet his sweetheart, Marion Fitzwalter. They strolled arm in arm through the great forest of Sherwood until they came to a beautiful, sun-dappled glade. Robert turned towards Marion, went down on one knee and asked, Marion, will you be my wife? And Marion replied, I will, with all my heart. In all England, there was not a more handsome pair than Robert and Marion. Maid Marion, as all the peasants called her. Standing together in the sunshine as they pledged their love, they hadn't a care in the world. But the young lovers were not alone. For behind one of the great oaks of the forest lurked Robert's treacherous steward, Warman, who had betrayed his master and become a spy for the Sheriff of Nottingham. The Sheriff and Robert were sworn enemies, for the Sheriff and his kind had treated the poor peasants worse than cattle, and Robert felt it was his duty to defend them and treat them with respect. Warman went running to the Sheriff with the news as fast as his bandy legs would carry him. He found the fat, red-faced Sheriff sitting in the gloomy Great Hall of Nottingham Castle, drinking wine with his henchman, Guy of Gisborne. Sir Guy, a man with evil eyes and a worse temper, did the sheriff's dirty work. The sheriff rubbed his pudgy fingers together with glee as Warman wheezed out his news. So, said the sheriff, young Robert wants to marry, does he? And he set his heart on the fair Marion. Well, let him dream. On his wedding day we will wake him up. The wedding was set for Midsummer's Day. In the weeks before it, the young happy couple were quite content to leave all the arrangements to Warman, unaware as they were of his treachery. The day of the wedding, Robert and Marion met in church. Just as the vows were to be taken, the church doors were flung back with a crash, and in strode the Sheriff of Nottingham, Guy of Gisborne loping at his side, and ten armed men following after them. Stop the ceremony, roared the Sheriff. What is the meaning of this outrage? quavered the priest. This man may not marry. He has been declared an outlaw. This so-called Earl of Huntingdon is a wolf's head. On what grounds? shouted Robert. On the testimony of this man, said the sheriff, pointing to Warman. Your steward claims you have plotted against the king. That is a lie, replied Robert. Take me to the king and I will swear an oath of loyalty. The sheriff growled. The king has left for the crusade. There are reports that he has gone missing, either killed or captured. His brother, my friend, Prince John, rules in his absence. He has outlawed you and stripped you of your title and your lands. If King Richard comes back, you may plead for their return. Guy of Gisborne chuckled. <laughs> Until then, continued the sheriff, Sir Guy here will manage your estates. So that is your plan, said Robert. You call me a wolf's head, but this Sir Guy is the real wolf. Robert turned to Marion. My love, I know you do not love me for my title and lands. Will you still take me, now that I have nothing, not even a name? I will, she said, and I will not rest until I have cleared you of these charges. The king will return and marry us himself. Then I fear nothing, said Robert. Turning, he picked up a bench and swung it, sending Sir Guy and the sheriff crashing to the floor. The king will return, and when he does, I will accept his judgment. Until then, I will make my own laws in the greenwood. I will call myself Robin Hood, a name that you will learn to hate and fear. Seize him, wheezed the sheriff as he lay sprawled in the aisle. But the outlaw, Robin Hood slipped into the forest.
Chapter 2 The Call of the Forest Once Robin had settled in the greenwood, men flocked to his side. Many in these turbulent times had been driven from their homes or unjustly accused of some crime. Others felt they must join Robin to fight against cruelty and injustice. And once they had found him, they had to stay with him, for every man of Robin's band was declared an outlaw. Now Robin was still just twenty years old, and he worried that all these men, some old enough to be his father, should follow him with such blind trust and perhaps come to their deaths for it. So one day he went for a walk alone in the forest to think what he should do. Will Scarlet, one of Robin's most trusted men, begged to come with him, for the Sheriff of Nottingham had offered a reward for Robin's head, and men might even then be searching the forest for him. But Robin refused. No man knows the forest as well as I, he said, but I will take my horn and blow it if I need you. Robin walked for miles, trying to get things straight in his head. The Sheriff of Nottingham was a bully. His master, Prince John, was a usurper who, if he gained the throne, would prove a tyrant. The poor lived like brutes. No woman was safe. No honest trader could sell his wares without paying bribes to the Sheriff's men. Something had to be done about it. But was it right to drag other men into what had started as a private quarrel? And could Robin expect Marion to wait for him, through the long years until King Richard returned, and Robin could claim his earldom again? Could it ever be right to defy the law? As he pondered these hard questions, Robin came to a stream, across which someone had laid a single plank, just wide enough for a man to cross. As Robin stepped onto the bridge, it wobbled alarmingly. He looked up, surprised out of his private thoughts, and saw that a strange man had also stepped onto the bridge from the other side. He was a giant of a fellow, towering above Robin. Make way and let me pass, said Robin. Make way yourself and let me pass, the stranger replied. Robin reached for his bow. He stared narrowly at the man. One false move and I'll shoot you through the heart. If you do, all men will call you coward, the man replied, for you have a longbow, but I have nothing but this wooden staff to support me as I walk. No man will ever call me coward, said Robin. He walked into a thicket of trees and cut an oaken staff. Then he returned to the bridge and shouted, Now I have a staff as well. Let us see who is the stronger. We will fight on this bridge, and the winner will be the one who knocks the other into the water. That is my kind of fight, said the stranger, and he stepped out into the middle of the bridge. Robin had little practice in fighting with a staff, for it was a low weapon with which peasants might settle their quarrels at a country fair. But he was a strong young man, and after all that thinking, he was ready for a fight. He swung the staff and caught the big man such a cracking blow that it made his bones ring. The stranger swung, Robin parried. The sound of wood on wood boomed over the water. The worst of it, thought Robin, was having to keep your balance on the narrow bridge while dodging blows and trying to knock your opponent off at the same time. Robin could see that his lighter frame and nimbler feet were an advantage over his opponent's bulky frame. He looked the big man straight in the eye and aimed again. The stranger seemed to slip and lose his balance. Robin felt as if his blood was on fire. He lunged forward and swung his staff as hard as he could. A smile flickered across the big man's lips as he settled his weight back on the bridge, flicked Robin's blow aside, and then cracked Robin across the head, hurling him into the water. It was all over in seconds. As Robin disappeared beneath the stream, the big man flung aside his staff and, falling to his knees, called, Where are you? Are you all right? When Robin surfaced, he was laughing. <laughs> Here I am, he said. You are a good fighter and a fair one, and I see that you could teach me a trick or two. Robin hauled himself out onto the riverbank and, dripping everywhere, took out his horn. His warning blast rang through the forest. In moments, half a dozen men in Lincoln Green were standing at his side, Will Scarlet among them. Will was one of several former peasants who had owed their lives and loyalty to Robert, Earl of Huntington, and now pledged the same service to Robin Hood, Lord of the Greenwood. "'What's happened?' shouted Will. 
Who is this man? If he hurt you, he shall die. Robin's men put arrows to their bows. Leave him alone, laughed Robin. A cracked head will soon mend, and no doubt I deserved it. This is a brave fellow, and I hope that he will join us. I can't do that, the man replied, for I am determined to go into the forest and find the man they call Robin Hood to offer him my service. Robin laughed again. You have found him, he said. I am Robin Hood, and you are welcome to my band. What is your name, friend? The big man looked abashed that he had introduced himself to his new leader by hitting him over the head with a wooden staff and dunking him in a river. My name is John Little, he said softly. Now it was the outlaw's turn to laugh. And no doubt you only drink small beer, said Will Scarlet. He turned to the others. His mother wouldn't let him drink anything stronger until he's fully grown. The giant turned bright red, and Robin took pity on him. It's not so bad a name, he said, but if you're going to be an outlaw, you must change it. We shall call you Little John. The men cheered, and Little John smiled. And so it was that Robin found the most faithful and good-hearted of all his men. He paid for him with a ducking and a sore head, but he never regretted the bargain. For Robin knew that if a man like Little John chose to follow him, his cause must be just and right. For Little John was no vagabond. The only fighting he had ever done was for fun at country fairs, when he would take on all comers at wrestling or fighting with quarterstaffs. But one day at Nottingham Fair, he saw Guy of Gisborne slash a peasant with his whip, shouting, Out of the way, you cur! <laughs> Little John swung his mighty fist and knocked Sir Guy to the ground. And so he had become an outlaw. But his only crime was to stand up for the weak against the strong. Chapter 3 The Castle of the North Wind Robin established his camp in a clearing beside a huge oak tree, with a stream running by for fresh water and plenty of game to hunt. Each evening, as they sat around the fire, many of his gang spoke bitterly about the sheriff and his men, living in comfort in Nottingham Castle. Robin just laughed. What do we need with castles of stone? he asked. This camp is castle enough for me, and this oak tree can be my tower. Here we can live off the land in comfort and safety. We will be more comfortable here than the sheriff in his castle, for we know where he is, but he does not know where we are. Then Robin called for a pen, ink and parchment, saying, I will send the sheriff such a letter that he will never sleep soundly in his castle again. This is what Robin wrote. Robin, Lord of the Greenwood, salutes the sheriff of Nottingham. We command you, on pain of death, to cease your cruel ways. Take pity on the poor and have mercy on those driven to steal to feed their families. If you don't, we shall harry you night and day. We shall hunt you down, even in your own castle. This I swear by God and his blessed mother and in the name of King Richard, given at our castle of the North Wind in the merry month of May. Robin's men burst into laughter. Much, the miller's son, who was unknown in Nottingham, said, I shall deliver the letter into the sheriff's hands myself. The next morning, Much set off to Nottingham with a letter. Robin and his men spent the morning practising archery. Little John, having the longest reach and the strongest arms, could shoot the furthest. Robin said, I would go a long way to see the man who could outshoot you, Little John. Will Scarlet said, You would not have to go far. A friar at Fountain's Abbey is the strongest bowman in this land. Brother Michael Tuck is his name. Then we must go and see this mighty man of God, said Robin. Robin and six of his men made their way to Fountain Dale, and there, by the river bank, they saw the friar. He was not so tall as Little John, but what he lacked in height he made up in girth. He was nearly completely round. Robin laughed. These friars certainly feed themselves well, he said. 
He told his men to hide behind a bank of ferns, but to come to his aid if he blew his horn. Robin walked along the river until he came to the friar, who was dressed in his religious habit, but with a sword strapped to his side, a shield in his hands, and a steel helmet on his head. Are the friars to go to war with the monks, father? asked Robin. No, my son, but I find it concentrates my mind on my prayers if I practice my skill at arms. Well, today you have the chance to do a good deed that will please God more than swordplay. I want to cross the river without getting wet, so just carry me over there, will you? The friar hoisted Robin onto his back and carried him through the fast and cold water. On the far side, Robin began to walk away. Not so fast! Called the friar, drawing his sword. Now you have the chance to do me a good turn. I want to cross back to the other side again, and you can do the carrying. Robin could scarcely lift the fat friar, and his knees started to buckle under the strain. He plunged forward through the water and just made it to the far side before his legs gave way. This time, Robin drew his sword. Carry me back, he ordered. Sighing, the friar lifted Robin up again. Halfway across, he shrugged his shoulders and sent Robin tumbling into the stream. Sink or swim, he shouted. I'll not be your beast of burden. Robin swam to the far side as the friar backed away. Robin took out his bow and fired arrows at the friar, but he turned them away with his shield. Shoot on! I have nothing else to do, and this is good practice. Robin, speechless with anger, plunged back across the river, sword in hand, and swung wildly at the mocking friar. The friar matched him blow for blow. No matter how hard he tried, Robin could not beat him. Weakened by the friar's blows, Robin cried, Wait! Wait! Let me give one blow on my horn! Robin blew. And Little John, Will Scarlet, and the others all tumbled out from behind the ferns. Wait! Wait! cried the friar. Let me whistle once! The friar whistled, and six savage dogs came running to his call. A dog for every man, said the friar, and you for myself. The dogs set on the men before they could draw their bows and began to rip at their clothes. Hold, hold! shouted Robin. The friar whistled again, and the dogs retreated. You are truly a warrior, said Robin, and a man for us. I am Robin Hood, and these are my men. Join us in the forest and be our priest. You shall eat well, I assure you. We live off the king's deer and the sheriff's purse. Very well, I'll come, said the friar. My name is Friar Tuck, and I vow to serve you and your outlaw band as priest for as long as you reign in the forest and there's venison to eat. When they got back to camp, Much had returned from his journey to Nottingham. Well, asked Robin, did the sheriff get his letter? Yes, Much replied. I gave it into his hand myself. How did he like it? His face turned yellow, then red, then purple, and he started to choke. Guy of Gisborne had to hit him on the back. As I made my escape, I could hear him bellowing, Where is the castle of the North Wind? Where indeed, said Robin, for the wind blows where it wills, and no man can command it. Chapter 4 A Guest at the Feast As Robin breathed in the appetizing smell of deer roasting over an open fire, he said, What a shame we have no guests to share our meal. Or to pay for it, quipped Will Scarlet. What a wonderful idea, said Robin. Why don't you take little John and Much and look out for a traveller who might be glad to pay for a hot meal as he journeys through the greenwood? So Will and the others went to watch over the forest path, at a point where the outlaws often held up travellers, taxing the rich for their passage, but letting the honest and poor go for free. 
At last, a knight came riding down the path. I don't think much of this one, said Little John. If he were a fish, I would throw him back. And indeed the man was a sorry sight. In travel-stained clothes, with one foot in his stirrup and the other dangling weakly by his horse's side. But though his clothes were poor, his back was straight and his chin jutted proudly before him. Will replied, We have found rich pickings before and a poorer cloaks than that. The three outlaws leapt out onto the path. Much caught hold of the horse's bridle, while Will Scarlet shouted, Stop! In the name of Robin Hood! Mind your manners, Will, Little John said. This gentleman is to be our guest. Then, with a flourish, the outlaw went down on one huge knee, saying, Welcome to the forest, kind sir. Please accompany us to our camp, where lunch awaits you. They brought the knight to the outlaw's camp, where Robin welcomed him. Sit down, he said, and eat and drink your fill. Would you like some of the king's roast deer, or perhaps you would care for some humble pie instead? The knight looked straight into Robin's eyes. I will be eating humble pie enough, my friend, in the days to come. Give me some roast deer, if you will. I see there is some story here, Robin replied. After the knight and the outlaws had eaten and drunk their fill, Robin said, Before you go on your way, Sir Knight, I must ask you to pay for your dinner. The knight replied, I wish that I could, but I have nothing to pay you with, only a few pennies that I need for my journey. Little John looked in the man's purse, and he was telling the truth. I will not take a penny, said Robin. But tell me, sir, how you come to be in such a poor state? My name is Sir Richard of the Lee, said the knight, and once I was a wealthy man. But my son took part in the tournament, and by an unlucky stroke killed the knight of Lancaster. It has taken all my money to buy his freedom, and I have had to borrow four hundred pounds from the abbot of St. Mary's with my own estate as security. Now the loan is due, and I cannot repay it. I'm going to plead with the abbot for more time. Your pleading will not get you far with that one, said Robin. He has laid his greedy hands on many estates before yours. What else can I do? asked the knight. Why, said Robin, you can pay the man his money. And with that, Robin fetched four hundred pounds from his secret store and gave it to Sir Richard. I will pay you back, stammered Sir Richard. I swear it by Our Lady. I know you will, said Robin. But for now, God speed you on your journey. Little John shall see you safe through the forest, and I shall expect to see you again in a year and a day. And with that, the knight rode off. In the abbey, the abbot was rubbing his hands. It is the day for Sir Richard of the Lee to repay his loan or lose his lands, he said. Where is he? He has not come, and in a few hours his lands will be mine forever. The cellarer of the abbey answered. The man is probably dead or hanged. Have a cup of wine against the cold. The abbot cackled with glee as the rich wine warmed him. At that moment, there was a rapping on the door. It was Sir Richard, asking to see the abbot. He laid down his sword and knelt. When the abbot saw the knight's worn clothing, he thought the lands were his for sure. Well, have you the money? asked the abbot. I have tried hard, said Sir Richard, but I have not been able to raise it. Please allow me more time. Your time is up, said the abbot. If you can't pay, you can't pay. I didn't say that, said Sir Richard rising to his feet and shaking out the four hundred pounds. All of the money is there, he said, and left, leaving the abbot and the cellarer scrabbling on the floor for the scattered coins. A year and a day later, Robin and his men waited in Sherwood for Sir Richard, who was due to repay his loan. Robin said, I fear some mischief may have befallen Sir Richard, for I expected him sooner. Don't you worry he won't pay you back, asked Will Scarlet. 
Never, said Robin. He swore by Our Lady, and there is no greater promise than that. Go to the path and see if Sir Richard is coming, and tell him his lunch is ready. Will, Little John, and Much, the miller's son, went looking. But instead of the knight, they saw riding along the forest path two black-habited monks. The outlaws invited them to lunch. As they sat down to dine, Robin asked the monks, Which abbey are you from? St. Mary's, replied the first monk. I am the cellarer. That is a shame, said Robin. I had hoped that you had been sent with money, for you serve Our Lady, and she has promised me repayment of a loan this very day. I am carrying no money, said the monk, just a few pennies for my travelling expenses. If what you say is true, said Robin, I will not take a penny from you. Little John, take a look in their saddlebags. Little John opened the monk's saddlebags and found more than eight hundred pounds in gold. I see you have brought my money, after all, in double measure, said Robin. I thank you for the service. And then he sent the crestfallen monks on their way. That evening, a rider came into Robin's camp. It was Sir Richard. Forgive me, friend, for leaving you waiting all day. On my way to see you, I came upon a wrestling match. A poor man, who had the prize, was being cheated of his right by a group of sneering nobles. I had to stay and put the matter right. To help the poor is the first duty of any man, said Robin Hood. I have brought you back the money you lent me, said Sir Richard, with thanks from the bottom of my heart. But I have already been repaid, said Robin. Our lady sent the cellarer of her abbey with eight hundred pounds this very day. But really, the overpayment is too much. So here is four hundred pounds back. I know you will use it to help the poor on your lands. Sir Richard took the money with thanks, and then he said, I thought long and hard for a gift to give you. You have saved my lands for me, but I cannot give you back your lands or your name. So I have brought you a yew longbow and a set of arrows trimmed with peacock feathers. May they never miss their mark. Chapter 5 The Archery Contest All this time, as Robin and his men made free of the king's deer and laughed at the law, the sheriff of Nottingham was plotting his revenge. You must lure Robin into a trap, advised Sir Guy of Gisborne. I see that, said the sheriff. But what trap would be cunning enough to catch someone as wily as Robin Hood? Hearing the story of Sir Richard and how he had given Robin a magnificent longbow, the sheriff struck the table with his fist. I have it, he shouted. We will hold an archery competition. All the bowmen in Nottinghamshire will come and strive to see who is the best shot of all. The prize shall be an arrow made of pure silver with feathers and head of gold. Robin will never resist such a lure. And it is true that when Robin heard of the competition, he longed to take part. But how could he? As soon as he showed his face in Nottingham, he would be captured. It was a moody Robin who joined his men at the bend in the road where they waylaid travellers through the forest. The dust of a cart appeared in the distance. Little John said, It is just the potter going to market, as he has done these past three years. Let him pass. Three years? said Robin. You mean this churl has been using our path for three years and never paid a penny's toll? As the cart approached, Robin leapt out and caught hold of the horse. Leave go, said the potter. Not until you have paid a toll, said Robin. Who are you that I should pay a toll? I am Robin Hood. Oh, in that case, said the potter, I will be happy to pay. Getting down from his cart, he swung his fist, knocking Robin over. There you are, he said, climbing back into his cart. I will be happy to pay such a toll every time I pass. 
Robin leapt up and they began to fight in earnest, exchanging blows and wrestling in the dust. At last, Little John emerged from hiding and pulled them apart. You are a man to reckon with, said Robin. You may drive through the forest every day and I shall never charge a toll again. The potter laughed. Then let us be friends, outlaw, and if I can be of help to you, you only have to ask. And now I shall be on my way. I don't want to miss the archery competition. Robin said, neither do I. Why not change clothes with me? Stay here, and my men will serve you a feast fit for a king, and I will go to Nottingham disguised in your clothes. So long as you don't forget to sell my pots, said the potter, and the deal was struck. Robin hid his bow and arrows in the potter's cart and drove into Nottingham as cool as you please. He found himself a good pitch right by the practice ground where the competition was to take place and was soon doing brisk business. Robin so enjoyed shouting out, Pots for sale! Best pots in Nottinghamshire! But he almost forgot about shooting in the competition. Archers from all around were taking part and many of them were fine archers indeed. But Robin saw that none of them were his match. He sold his last five pots to the sheriff's wife and said to her, Though I am but a humble potter, I would love to try my hand for the silver arrow. I have a bow in my cart that someone gave me as a present. Will I be allowed to enter? I am sure that anyone can enter who has a bow to shoot with, said the sheriff's wife. So Robin took his place at the end of the line. The crowd was silent as the first archer shot his arrow at the target. This man was known locally as an expert archer and many had bet good money that he would take the prize. Few archers could match him for accuracy at such a distance, and with so many eyes on them. The arrow hit the mark, and as it thrummed in the central circle, the watchers erupted into cheers. No other archer shot so well. Some even missed the target altogether to jeers and catcalls from the crowd. Then Robin stepped up and strung his bow. Robin calmed his mind, emptying it of everything save the arrow and the target. He fired and sent his arrow whistling into the wooden marker dead in the middle, splitting it into three even pieces. Well shot, shouted the sheriff's wife. And even the sheriff himself clapped politely, though he was sick at heart that his plan had not worked. Robin Hood had not turned up and now he had to give the precious silver arrow, which had cost him a fortune, to a mere potter. Nevertheless, he handed over the prize. That was a fine shot, fellow, he said. Someone bring me the arrow, he fired, so that I can see how it was fletched. Robin said, I thank your honour for your kind words and for this silver arrow, but I must be on my way. There is no rest for a poor man in these times. And with that... Robin climbed back in the cart and began to drive off as fast as he could. If he was not clear of the gates before the sheriff guessed who he was, he could be shut in the city and trapped like an animal. Robin was just at the gates when the stewards brought his winning arrow to the sheriff. This is a fine arrow indeed, said the sheriff. Look how well it is made. The Fletcher has even used peacock feathers, not goose quills. And then the sheriff remembered the story of Sir Richard's present to Robin Hood and realized how he had been tricked. Guards! Guards! he shouted. Stop that potter! But Robin Hood was already past the gates, on his way back to the safety of the Greenwood, while the sheriff was left to nurse his injured pride. End of side one. Robin Hood, side two. Chapter six, Flight to the Forest. All the while Robin was living in Sherwood, gathering men to follow him, Marion was living quietly at home with her father, Lord Fitzwalter. She had sworn to wait for Robin, and wait she would, though she had never thought the waiting would be so long. Would King Richard never come home? 
the Sheriff of Nottingham had left her alone so far, but now that Robin had tricked him at the archery contest, his anger boiled over. He told Sir Guy of Gisborne that if Guy could kill or capture Robin, he could have Robin's lands and title for himself and any other reward he wanted. What about Robin's bride-to-be? leered Sir Guy. If you want her, you can have her, said the sheriff. Then let us go and tell her the happy news, said Sir Guy. They rode to Lord Fitzwalter's house with a troop of armed men, and burst in on him and Marion at their private prayers. What is the meaning of this? spluttered the angry lord. It could have several meanings, replied the sheriff coolly. It could mean treason and black conspiracy against Prince John and the officers of the king's law. It could mean outlawry. It could mean the gallows. But these are unpleasant meanings. Meanings we need not concern ourselves with. Instead, let us look on the bright side and say that this visit means joy and celebration and the longed-for union of two young lovers. Lovers? Why, is your daughter Marion not pining to get married? You know she is. Then she shall. She shall marry the Earl of Huntingdon. But how? Robert, Earl of Huntingdon, has been outlawed by your own command. I do not speak of that common criminal, Robin Hood. How could you think of allying your family to such a scoundrel? I speak of good Sir Guy here, who has long admired your daughter. I have charged Sir Guy with the arrest of Robin Hood, and when Robin Hood is swinging from the gallows, I will confirm Sir Guy in the title of Earl of Huntingdon, and the possessions of all that wicked felon's land. What better could you hope for than that your daughter should become Sir Guy's loving wife? No! shouted Lord Fitzwalter. It's absurd! I would advise you not to take that line, said the sheriff, or I might tell Prince John how you and your daughter have plotted with Robin Hood against the realm. Sir Guy can become Lord Fitzwalter as easily as Earl of Huntingdon. And I do not think you, my lord, with your creaking limbs, would make a happy outlaw in the forest. And do you want to see the proud maid Marion reduced to an outlaw's wench? Think about it. As the sheriff and Sir Guy took their leave, Sir Guy placed his hand on Marion's cheek and said, do not keep me waiting long, my sweet. As the door closed behind them, Marion turned to her father. Her face was white, save for the red marks of Sir Guy's fingers, and she was shaking with fury. Father, how dare they? They dare because they have the power to do what they threaten. They can strip me of my title and lands, and without them, who am I and who are you? Just two more vagabonds whom the sheriff can dispose of as he likes. Who is there to protect the likes of us? There is my Robin, said Maid Marian, her voice trembling with pride. He would look after us. I know he would. But the sheriff was right, my dear. I am too old and too ill to live in the greenwood. It is not summer all year round, and once the harsh winter came and the cold and wet seeped into my clothes, my end would not be far off. If I leave this manor, where I can lie on a goose-feathered bed, eat three meals a day and sit by the fire in the evening to warm my old bones, I will not see another spring. But I am young and fit, and with my robin at my side, no winter wind could chill me. Father, let me go to him. You know he is a man of honour. And once I am gone, how can the sheriff act against you? Promise Sir Guy my hand, if you like, but he will have to find me first. You are right, Marion. But how can you escape? The sheriff will have posted men to watch for such a move. Do not ask, father. And then when the sheriff asks you, you will not know. But do not worry for me. I am not afraid of the sheriff or his men, and I know the hidden ways of the Greenwood as well as Robin himself. Next morning, at dawn, 
Marion dressed as a page boy, off on some household errand. She slipped from her room and out across the courtyard, past the hall, before reaching the side gate. Easing it open, she tiptoed across the creaking wooden moat bridge, walked quickly down the path, and when she reached the trees, ran into the safety of the forest. When the sheriff and Sir Guy arrived at the house, Marion was long gone. Where is she? When did she go? screamed the sheriff. Lord Fitzwalter could only say, My lord, I do not know. I told her that I was going to promise her in marriage to Sir Guy, as you suggested, and she must have fled. But do not worry, a mere slip of a girl will not get far. Surely you had men posted outside. The sheriff called in his spies and asked them if any of them had seen Maid Marion leave. The one who had been watching the side door said, no, sir, I did not. No one left but a page boy at dawn. A page boy? You dunderhead! You stupid oaf! Maid Marion is as slim as a willow wand. Dress her in boy's clothes and she would pass as a boy anywhere. Follow her! But the sheriff's men could not follow Marion's tracks through the secret forest ways, and they soon lost her trail. And so it was that later that day a new recruit arrived at Robin's camp. He was taken to Robin, who, looking at the boy before him, said, You are too young for this dangerous life. Go back home and join us when you are older. The page boy replied, My home is here with you, my dear. And so saying, he took off his cap and unpinned his hair. As the golden locks came tumbling down, Robin exclaimed, Marion! The lovers fell into each other's arms, overjoyed at their reunion. That night, the outlaws held a feast to welcome Marion to their camp, and they drank many a toast to Robin and Marion, Marion and Robin, Robin and Marion. Chapter 7 the Master Butcher. When Maid Marion told Robin about the sheriff's threats, he said, This man must be taught a lesson. So Robin changed clothes with a butcher and went once more to market in Nottingham. He set up his stall and was soon doing a roaring trade, for he sold more meat for a penny than the other butchers did for three. He even sold meat to the sheriff's wife, giving her a prime cut for free. She was so pleased that she allowed him and the other butchers to dine at the sheriff's hall. When they sat down to eat, Robin said grace. May God make us able to eat all at the table. All the butchers laughed. This young scapegrace seemed harmless enough. And when Robin said, I'll pay for everyone and slapped five pounds on the table, they were ready to forgive him anything. The sheriff, seeing the young man throwing his money about, thought, This is some young fool, and a fool and his money are soon parted. So he engaged the young butcher in conversation. Tell me, said the sheriff, do you have horned beasts for sale? He meant cattle. That I do, said Robin. Two or three hundred, and a hundred acres of land. Do you know what they might be worth? The sheriff offered Robin three hundred pounds, half the true value. Then come with me and bring the money, said Robin, and if you like the beasts and the land, we can do a deal. It was all the sheriff could do not to dribble down his chin at the thought of the wonderful bargain he was getting. So the sheriff mounted a palfrey, and he and Robin rode out of town. The path leads through the forest, said Robin. God protect us from Robin Hood, answered the sheriff. As they went deep into Sherwood, they came across a herd of a hundred red deer. Here are some of my horned beasts, said Robin. How do you like them? What do you mean, fellow? These are the king's deer. And where are your hundred acres? Why, we have been riding through them. All Sherwood is mine, if it is any man's. With that, Robin blew three blasts on his horn. Half a dozen of his men appeared and surrounded the sheriff. 
I have eaten in your hall today and paid for the privilege. And I have given my compliments to your lady, too. Now you shall return the honour, said Robin. The outlaws escorted the sheriff, blindfolded, down the winding ways to their secret camp. When they took off the blindfold, he saw Robin and Marion with a merry laugh on her lips. So the sheriff had to dine on venison poached from under his very nose, and wine stolen from his own cellars, and Robin made sure that he paid three hundred pounds for the privilege. They set the sheriff on his horse and led him back to Nottingham, a poorer and a wiser man. Chapter 8 The Return of the King One autumn day, Robin stopped an abbot with a cowl and a broad hat, and a monk on the road through the forest. Sir Abbot, said Robin, stay a while with us. We are poor freemen of the forest. Our only wealth is the king's deer, while you have churches full of gold. Give us what you can for charity. I have only forty pounds, said the abbot. Here it is. Thank you, said Robin. Twenty pounds I will divide among my men, and twenty you shall keep, for I wouldn't leave you penniless. The abbot said, I may not be rich, but I bear great news. I spent last night in the company of the king in Nottingham. He is back from the Crusades. Long he lay in the prison of Leopold, Duke of Austria, but now he has returned to reclaim his throne. God bless his majesty, said Robin. Now surely England will be itself again, and these bloated sheriffs will be brought to book. You have brought great news. Come to our camp and toast the king, and taste the flesh of his deer. Afterward, Robin set up a target for archery. The abbot said, That target is too far away. The best archers in the army couldn't hit it. But the archers of Robin Hood can, said Robin. Any man whose arrow misses receives a blow on the head. At first all the men found it easy, but one by one they missed. At last only Robin was left. Just as he was about to shoot, a bird flew up and distracted him, and his arrow went wide. Little John, still rubbing his smarting ear, roared with laughter. Robin went up to the abbot. I am ready for your blow. I am a man of God, said the abbot. I cannot hit you. I will allow you to do it, said Robin. The abbot rolled up his sleeve to reveal a surprisingly well-muscled arm. His blow knocked Robin off his feet. That arm has done more than hold a prayer book, said Robin, and he looked the abbot intently in the face. Then Robin sank to his knees and said, Your Majesty, accept my service. The abbot was King Richard, and the monk his minstrel, Blondel. The king said, I heard two things about you, Robin. The first was from the Sheriff of Nottingham. He said you were a traitor and a villain. The second was from the people. They said you were generous and honest. The Sheriff is a liar. Therefore, I pardon you for your crimes and restore you to your title and lands. Is there anything more I can do for you? Marion stepped forward. Your Majesty, I swore not to marry Robin until you came home. Will you give me in marriage to my true love, Friar Tuck and Marius? With all my heart, said the king. So Robin and Marion were married in the greenwood where they first gave each other their hearts. King Richard himself danced at their wedding, and the minstrel Blondel sang. Underneath the greenwood tree, I found the maid who is for me. Chapter 9 Fight to the Death For five years, Robin and Marion lived happily together, sometimes in Robin's old home and sometimes in the greenwood, for many of the outlaws had continued to live in the forest under the protection of the king. But then came the sad news of King Richard's death. Prince John was now King John, 
Robin's enemies were once more the power in the land, and Robin Hood an outlaw. I fear our happiness must come to an end, said Robin. Nothing could spoil our love, said Marion, so I fear nothing. Little John, who was staying with them, said, If we do no wrong, no one will trouble us. But Robin answered, Last night I had a terrible dream. Two men set on me, tied me up, and beat me half to death, and took my bow from me. One of them was Sir Guy of Gisborne. What are dreams? asked Marion. Dreams are just like the wind. They may blow strong all night, but in the morning they are still. Nevertheless, said Robin, I am troubled. Come, little John, let us go into the forest and see what is to be seen. Robin and little John had not gone far when they saw a tall and strong fellow leaning against a tree. He was clad in a horse's hide, with the head and mane covering his face, and the tail hanging down behind. In the woods nearby, a wood wheat was singing its mournful song. Perhaps I am still in my dream, said Robin. Stand there, master, said little John. I will go and ask this man his business. I have never stood back while my men put themselves at risk, said Robin. Do not ask me to do so now. I will deal with this man, be he friend or foe. You go to the camp to warn Will Scarlet and the others that trouble may be coming. So Little John set off for the camp, and Robin approached the man dressed in the horse's hide. Good morning, my good fellow, said the man. Good morning to you, said Robin. I see you are carrying a longbow. Are you then an archer? I have come hunting game, said the man. And what game is that? asked Robin. The outlaw Robin Hood, replied the man. But I am lost in this cursed forest with its winding ways. I need a guide. I can guide you, said Robin. No man knows the forest better than I. But first, as you are an archer, let us set up a target and shoot together and see which is the better with his longbow. So they cut a long thin branch from a nearby shrub and set it up as a target at the length of a strong bow-shot. The stranger fired his arrow, but missed. Robin fired and split the branch in two. That was a fine shot, said the stranger, worthy even of Robin Hood himself. Tell me, stranger, what is your name? I will tell you my name if you will tell me yours. My name is Sir Guy of Gisborne, said the man in the horse's hide, and my name is Robin Hood brave outlaw replied. At once both men drew their sword and battle began. The two deadly enemies cussed and parried, dodged and thrust, their swords flickering in the sunlight as they tried to deliver a mortal wound to the other. Meanwhile, little John had not gone far when he saw a dreadful sight. Two of his comrades lying dead on the forest floor, and Will Scarlet fleeing for his life, the Sheriff of Nottingham at his heels with a party of armed men. Little John drew his bow, knocked an arrow, took aim at the sheriff, and let fly. But the bow was made of young wood and sent the shot awry. It found its mark in one of the sheriff's men and sent him tumbling to the ground. But Little John had no chance to let fly again. Six men had seized him, and he was quickly tied to a tree. The sheriff said, John Little, you will be tied to two horses and dragged from here to a high hill, and there you shall hang on the gallows tree. If that is the will of Christ, said Little John. At that moment, a horn rang out, a harsh, discordant note that carried through the forest. Aha! That is a guy of Gisborne's horn, said the sheriff. He told me he would blow it when that traitor Robin Hood was finally dead. The fight between Robin and Sir Guy had been a long and bitter struggle. At the last, Robin tripped over a tree root and lost his balance. Sir Guy seized his chance. He thrust his sword, sending it into Robin's left side. As Robin fell, he swung wildly. It was a clumsy stroke, but it caught Sir Guy unawares and killed him instantly. Robin stood up, blood welling from the grievous wound in his side. He took his knife and cut off Sir Guy's head, for Sir Guy was the only man who had ever shown Maid Marian disrespect. Then Robin took off his suit of Lincoln Green and put on Sir Guy's horse's hide. He took out Sir Guy's horn and blew a rousing blast. 
That was the noise that the sheriff heard. So when Robin arrived, dressed in the horse's hide, the sheriff shouted, Welcome, Sir Guy! Or should I say, the Earl of Huntingdon? Call me Earl of Huntingdon, said Robin, if you please. Seeing little John tie to the tree, Robin took out his knife. Let me deal with this fellow, here and now. As you wish, said the sheriff. Robin went up to little John and quickly cut the rope with his knife, handing him Sir Guy's bow as he did so. He took up his own bow, and the two of them drew on the sheriff. Robin threw back the horse's head hood. It is I, Robin. Sir Guy lies dead back there in the wood. I have cut off his head, and I will do the same to you if you do not leave this forest now. The sheriff and his men turned tail and ran. Behind them, Robin fainted away in Little John's arms. Chapter 10 Imprisoned The next morning, Robin went alone into Nottingham, weak from his wound, to the church of St. Mary's to confess his sins. All his life, Robin had been devoted to the Blessed Virgin, and it was in her church alone that he felt truly safe. Marian begged him not to go, but he said, I have trusted to Our Lady in worse situations than this. As he knelt down in church, a monk who was there saw him, his head bathed in a shaft of light from a window, and knew at once that it was Robin Hood. For the man had once been stopped by Robin and the outlaws, and had been forced to pay for his passage through the forest. He slipped out of the church and went straight to the sheriff with the news. The sheriff marched on the church with a troop of men armed with swords and staves. When Robin saw them, he sighed. Little John, now I need you. But Robin was alone. He drew his sword, but was quickly overpowered and thrown into a damp, dark dungeon to await the hangman. When the news reached the outlaws in the forest, some even fainted from the shock. They had thought Robin could never be outwitted or overcome. But little John said, Stand up straight, you weaklings. All is not lost. The three outlaws who had always been closest to Robin, little John, Will Scarlet and Friar Tuck, set off for Nottingham to free Robin or die in the attempt. On the way, they met a monk bearing a letter to the sheriff with the seal of King John. What is in that letter? asked Friar Tuck. It is an order from the king that the sheriff must bring to him the outlaw they call Robin Hood, said the monk. I am as good a monk and therefore as good a messenger as you, said Friar Tuck. The outlaws grabbed and bound the monk and took the letter. When they arrived at the sheriff's castle, Friar Tuck demanded admittance. I have an urgent letter from the king himself with his seal. The sheriff read the letter and said, You can tell the king not to worry. I have the man in custody. I must see for myself, and then I will take the news to the king at once, said Friar Tuck. Very well, said the sheriff. So Friar Tuck went down to the dungeons, and Little John and Will Scarlet followed. The jailer jangled his keys, searching for the one that opened Robin's cell. As soon as he had opened the door, the outlaws tied him up, freed Robin, and locked the jailer in the cell in his place. It was morning before the sheriff discovered that the bird had flown. Chapter 11 The Final Arrow The outlaws fetched Robin away from the dungeon, but they made slow progress into the forest for Robin was sick. His wound from his fight with Sir Guy was still open and raw. He had caught a fever, and his talk was rambling and confused. Robin could hardly keep on his feet. He stumbled over every tree root, and if little John had not taken one arm and Will Scarlet the other, he would have fallen. When little John called him Robin, Robin just said, Many speak of Robin Hood, but never shot his bow. 
and he began to croon to himself one of the ballads the common folk had made up about him. And many sing of grass, of grass, and many sing of corn, and many sing of Robin Hood, no, not where he was born. It was not in the hall, the hall, nor in the painted bower, but it was in the good green wood, among the lily flower. And after that, he lapsed into semi-consciousness, mumbling and coughing and sometimes crying out, Marion! Marion! They came to a dark stream, and there they met an old woman in black who was washing some clothes and wailing, I curse you, Robin Hood! She was like some creature of doom from an old tale, and Robin began to shiver and shake. Are you going to bury me? he asked. I do not like this, said Little John. Marion! Marion! cried Robin. Where is Maid Marion? asked Will Scarlet. She's gone to Kirkless Priory for protection against the sheriff, said Little John. Then let us take Robin to Kirkley's, said Friar Tuck. The prioress is Robin's cousin. She will not let any harm come to him if he is left there to get better. So the outlaws carried Robin to the priory and left him in the charge of the prioress and Maid Marion. When they had laid Robin in a bed, the prioress said to Marion, Leave him to me for now. He must be let blood, if he is to recover fully. Marion laid her hand to Robin's forehead. He was feverish and scarcely knew her. You are the light of my heart, she said. Soon you will be well, and we will walk in the forest again. And when Marion had gone out of the room, the prioress took her lancing knives and, opening a vein in his arm, let Robin's blood. But she did not close the wounds, for though she was Robin's cousin, she was in the pay of the sheriff, and she meant Robin no good at all. Her father and Robin's father had been twins. Robin's father, born just a few minutes sooner, inherited the title and lands of the Earl of Huntingdon, according to the law of the land. The younger twin got nothing, and had spent his life in bitter envy of his brother. By rights, the title should have been mine, he would say, and he would make his daughter swear with him. We'll get even with him one day. That day had come. Robin felt the world swimming back into focus as the blood ran from his veins. He knew that he was weakening fast, but he managed to find the strength to reach his horn and set it to his lips. It was a feeble enough sound he made, but it reached far across the greenwood. Little John, Will Scarlet, and Friar Tuck heard it, and hurried back to the priory. And Maid Marian heard it, and rushed to Robin's side. What Robin and Maid Marian said to each other in the last few moments alone together in this world, no one will ever know. Soon, the outlaws had joined them. No, oh, Robin, what have they done to you? cried Little John. I have been betrayed. I fear they have brought me to my death, said Robin. I will burn this nunnery to the ground, said Little John, his face red with fury. But Robin replied, Though a woman has murdered me, I will cause no hurt to a woman. Even in death, leave them alone, I beg of you. He panted with the effort of speaking. Then Robin said, Bring me my bow. With the last of his dying strength, Robin set an arrow to the bow, steadied it, and loosed it out of the open window. The outlaws could see its peacock feathers glistening in the sun as it soared out into the forest. Wherever that arrow falls, said Robin, there let me lie. 
I will be at peace in the greenwood with the trees and the birds and the good red deer. And with that, he died in Maid Marian's arms, the greatest outlaw and the fairest man that England has ever seen. They buried him where his arrow fell and set a stone there in his memory. Here, underneath this little stone, lies Robert, Earl of Huntingdon. No archer was as he so good, and people called him Robin Hood. Such outlaws as he and his men will England never see again. You have been listening to Robin Hood. I'm Johan Griffith. Thank you for listening.